All right. Does fraud risk management? Do we all know what fraud risk management is? Have we heard of fraud risk management? Uh, fraud risk management, programs specifically designed to prevent, detect, and deter fraudulent criminal acts. Uh, it's a big aspect of what, as, what we do as forensic accountants. It's not just to f detect fraud, but it's also to manage that risk of fraud. Next page. So fraud risk service types, fraud risk assessments, Proactive and reactive fraud detection and audit assist procedures for fraud. Uh, proactive and reactive. Proactive is clearly tests designed to prevent fraud before. Reactive is we think fraud has occurred and now we need to test for it. Essentially, the procedures are mostly the same that are performed. It's just a matter of at when you perform them. Um, there are some slight differences, but mostly they are performed in the same manner. Uh, audit assist procedures. Things that are done during the audit that uh, uh, most of us are not auditors in the room, but as auditors, as a firm that we could help uh, clients with to prevent fraud. And I'll, I'll just jump in right quick just to talk about an example of, of why you would actually do these steps and, and how you can kind of sell ultimately the, the client on you know, why are they going to spend the, the money to actually do fraud risk management? Why are they going to analyze some of this? And give an example of a client. And so the, the client had um, two issues in a previous six month period. And both of those issues were, I don't know, if that, is that working back there? Can you hear? Yes? Okay. Um, so those two issues were specifically related to inventory. And so the, the client was saying, well, I've got an inventory problem. And what we said, well, do you really have an inventory problem? Are you certain you have an inventory problem? Or do you potentially have a different problem? And they said, well, what do you mean? And we said, well, let us do some steps around fraud risk assessment for you. Let us do some brainstorming sessions. Let us put together a questionnaire. We'll send the questionnaire out to the appropriate members of management of the organization. And once we send those out and we collect the results, we'll, we'll have some kind of smaller brainstorming sessions based on the results of that. And so we started doing some of the assessment and then we started looking at some of the controls they had around inventory. And we specifically wanted to look at the two issues that they had encountered in the previous six months. And what we were able to identify related to those two issues was that in both instances, the loss that they had incurred from inventory was as a result of collusion. And so the design of the controls that they had were pretty good, but ultimately several employees colluded with each other ultimately to defraud the organization. So they had come to find out, spent a substantial sum of money and time both in designing controls to protect their inventory. And so when we walked in the door, we could have spent a lot of money ultimately for them to spend on us re-evaluating their inventory controls and procedures. However, we would have likely come to a similar conclusion that their previous consultants had come to in that they helped design some controls for them and the controls were the types of controls necessary in order to protect their assets. From the brainstorming sessions, we ultimately identified that their true risk area their, where they lacked controls was actually around purchase cards and fuel cards. The organization had never really taken a look at the processes and procedures that they had implemented around both of these. And so ultimately we said, really, this is your risk area. And after <coughs> performing the procedures around fuel cars, what we were able to identify for the organization was that they had a lot of employees that were no longer with them who still had fuel cars, who were still using those fuel cards. 
the organization was still paying for those fuel cards. They also had similar issue with their purchase cards, where they had employees that were no longer with the organization that still had purchase cards, that were still using those purchase cards. So for the organization, they could have called us in. We could have looked at inventory again for them. They could have spent a lot of money for us to analyze their processes and procedures, and we would have basically said, well, you have a lot of controls in place, and your issue is that you need to inform your employees about tone at the top and find ways to help mitigate some of the opportunities to collude, but really the risk was somewhere else. And absent doing some of these assessments, they would have never known that that was really where their high risk was. So this is kind of how we can go to, to the, the clients and tell them, you know, it's not always the, the clearly evident thing in your mind as the client that you think is your real high risk area, sometimes it's something else that might not even be on your radar. And these are the ways in which you can identify some of those things. Next slide. Next slide. So the forensic data analysis methodology, planning. Planning is always very important. Uh, discuss analysis capabilities. Uh, many big companies like uh, Tyler used to work at Coke uh, has an, an internal function that can do a lot of the capabilities that a lot of smaller companies have to hire externally someone like us or another forensic accountant to be able to help them with. Uh, customized scope to the client's needs. Um, sure, most people are more aware of the sort of fee pressures a lot of people underneath are, are, are under uh, recently and getting things done for as low a cost as possible for the best job that you can perform. So customizing the scope to just meet their needs, but to do it in a manner that will identify all of their items is very crucial. Uh, timeline, agree, and budgets. Again, making sure you work within your constraints, but also to uh, have a successful result. Um, identify risk. Discussions, research, preliminary analysis. Research is a big deal, uh, extremely, extremely big deal, as is discussions. Um, most of what we do in the forensic, uh, forensic data analysis is in industries that vary every day. Um, we are by no means experts in global shipping and then medical practices and then government or organizations and all, and all these different industries where all these risks exist. There are trends that sort of extend between all these organizations in these different areas of, of the field in which we can use to relate all these different entities, but to understand the, re the entity, that you, the field in which your entity operates in is very important. And brainstorming and assess client environmental risks with the client and the team. The client a lot of times knows their risk uh, better than you can know a lot of times, and having discussion with that client is very important. So extracting data, planning the extraction, preparing the request list, and assisting monitoring. The best way, and I'll talk about it a little bit when I go into ACL, the best way to get data is through what's called ODBC, which is an online database connection. And um, I was explaining to it is, if you are trying to do analysis, you will ask for it, and you will never get it. So moving beyond that, the best way is to actually request information and monitor whoever is responsible for, for housing that information in the company and have them extract for you. Um, how many people have heard of delimited files? And you've heard of, I'm sure, comma separated files and that sort of things. How many people have heard of pipe delimited files? Anybody? Does anybody know what a pipe is? And computer terms, not within the building. <laughs> um, so delimited files come in all shapes and sizes. You, most common is comma separated files, CSVs, a lot of things get exported into Excel. Uh, pipe delimited files are exactly the same, but instead of using a comma, which is frequent in numbers, text, what we write, it uses a pipe. Um, I don't have a keyboard example, but if you look, I think it's a forward slash, it's a forward slash, backslash. Uh, one of the it's one of the slashes. I, don't, I, get the, I think it's the forward. It's underneath the backspace key. Above it, there's a straight vertical line. It's like a colon, but it's a straight line. That's called a pipe. I don't know what it's used for in anything in typing, 
other than it's a great delimiter when you're doing files because no one uses it. Um, so getting a pipe delimited file is one of the best files you can get because you're almost certain to know where each individual item breaks so that you can create your spreadsheet off of that. Um, again, also getting the data from someone who knows what they're doing uh, typically helps. Um, so pipe delimited files also getting what's called data definitions, which is identifying how large each uh, column width is supposed to be so you can understand where your breaks are supposed to fall and so that you don't miss a number into one column and stick it into another or get your addresses mixed up into four columns. Um, usually the biggest hindrance to doing our type of work is bad data. Bad data is typically bad results. Um, it is very difficult when someone gives you scratchy copies of PDFs and gives you 18,000 pages of them and you're expected to make heads and tails of it. Uh, we have some of the technology to um, most people, I think, we use ACL a lot. We also use IDEA. I think most people know what IDEA is. It's got a pretty good PDF reader. It's better than OCRing in, in Acrobat. But it is n by no means a uh, silver bullet for trying to understand poorly scanned, copied, or printed PDFs. So proper data is very important to doing any sort of uh, analysis. And analyzing data, completeness testing, preparing the data, and analyzing procedures. Uh, a lot of these terms are terms that are used in ACL, and I believe they're the same in IDEA, um, to can sort of bring it into Excel terms. Summarizing is kind of like a pivot table, um, trend analysis. Extracting is pulling data out of a table into a separate table. Uh, joining is to join information from two tables based on unique identifier into a third table. And appending is taking information from one table and appending it to the bottom of the other. But if you're not careful, if you have different columns, different descriptions, it can uh, sometimes be a little hairy to do appending. Most people just do joins. The, uh, the other thing about completeness testing, a lot of people forget about this, whether it's from a forensic analytic perspective, whether it's from an audit perspective, or from a tax perspective. People look at a set of data and the client provides it to them and they say, okay, well, this is a complete set of data. And they don't think about, well, how do I verify the completeness of this set of data? Do I have all of the month's worth of transactions? Is there some way in which I can agree this back to a financial statement? Is there some way I can agree this back to a tax return? Is there some way to summarize the data if I can't agree it necessarily to a tax return or a financial statement? Is there some way I can summarize the data by month and look at the trends? You know, do they have fairly consistent sales across the month in most years? And all of a sudden in this year in December, I have half the amount of sales that I had last December. Well, that might tell you that I'm missing half of December's data. And so the extraction, when somebody extracted it from their system, they put in an end date of, and we've had this happen, and put in an end date of December 15th instead of December 31st. Somebody keyed in correctly or just didn't think about what they were doing, and so their extraction was the wrong extraction compared to what we were looking for. And so if you spend hours upon hours analyzing this data, looking for results and what is this data telling you, but you didn't start with the step of verifying that you had a complete set of data, you're going to have meaningless results you're going to spend a lot of time spinning your wheels that you're going to have to completely redo. So these two, two steps of getting your data and then verifying that it is, in fact, what you were looking for are, are very important steps. And in my mind, probably the two most important steps of any analytic that you're going to perform on any set of data. Next slide. So, Review and refine, as Tyler said. Review the data for completeness, but then when you get the data, identify the anomalies, corroborate results, and assess the need for additional analysis. And as we've said a few times, ab anomalies do not mean fraud. Anomalies mean raise awareness, red flag, but anomalies do not necessarily mean fraud. Reporting, provide results to the client. Uh, Tyler spoke to it earlier. What does the client want? Does the client want a written report? Does the client want presentation? Does the client want a, a WebEx? Do they want a phone call? Understand what the client wants and how you're supposed to deliver it to them is very crucial. And then document your procedures and results. Um, they're going to want to know how you did it, and we're going to want to have documented and to keep how we did it so that we have 
um, ourselves covered and for future reference to understand how these procedures were found out and results were found out. Next. So some of the ways to begin your fraud risk assessment, identify some risks, uh, workshops, interviews, brainstorming, uh, questionnaires, particularly of management and people in, uh, in the areas of high risk, process mapping, heat maps, uh, comparisons with other organizations, do benchmark te testing, and uh, round tables are also a really good way to get discussions going and get thoughts flowing. Uh, does anyone know what a heat map is, process mapping heat maps? Does anyone use them? Um, heat maps is sort of uh, a way that people, uh, as, a, as a, someone who's assessing the risk can identify the highest uh, areas for risk. So it's sort of a, I don't have a drawing tool, but it's like a T-chart or a graph where you've got the significance on one axis and the likelihood on the other. And so something that's low significance and low likelihood may spend less time on your, on your fraud risk assessment. And something that's high significance and high likelihood, you may want to focus more time, more resources. And all those things will sort of flesh out in brainstorming sessions and in roundtable discussions. A lot of that can be subjective and objective. Um, sometimes you can look at significance if you have a set of data and you, you understand um, times that it occurred and the amount that was involved in the times that it occurred, it can be more objective. But oftentimes when you're doing some of these heat maps, you're having to make a subjective determination as to what is the likelihood of something like this occurring and then what is the significance. And the other thing about significance is that significance doesn't necessarily mean the value of that one item occurring. It could be a different calculation of significance. And a given as, a, as an example of that, a bribe to a public official. So if I go to some other country, and I'm, I'm a, a US-based company, I go to another country and I bribe a public official um, for business reasons in order to, you know, some countries in some of the more, more drier areas, water is a big thing. And so if I want access to water, for instance, and so I want to go meet with a minister of whatever it may be to discuss how I can utilize water in this country to run my manufacturing business, and I pay that government official $1,000 to have a meeting with me, well, now I've got an issue. It was $1,000, so maybe I'm a multi-billion dollar company, and the significance of that from a dollar threshold may not be huge, but the significance of that to a reputational perspective can result in a huge dollar figure because of the reputational risk to my stock price. So for instance, if I'm on the front page of the newspaper saying that I bribed a cup public official in some other country, of which we have seen some examples very recently of some very large companies having these issues and what happened to their stock price. It tanked. Because investors don't necessarily want to be in a situation where they're invested in an organization that has a lack of integrity and is going out into the, into the world violating laws and is going to be subjected to investigation, to potential fines and everything else that's involved with violations of both the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and UK now has a UK Bribery Act. And so the likelihood and significance of the significance of $1,000 can be the subjectivity associated with identifying what is the significance of that can be different than just saying what is the dollar amount. So you've got to look at these things in, in, in a little bit different way to ultimately create a, a, a map to identify what are those risk areas that you want to take the limited funds of the organization, because every organization only has limited funds ultimately to mitigate these risks that they have. Organizations don't necessarily have unlimited funds to implement the best practices around everything, and so they have to look at what are those risk areas where they want to use those funds. So, moving on, these are sort of Tyler has adapted through his experience of the six steps for proactive reactive detection. These are very similar, and, and most steps are the same as Tyler discussed before to the FBI's uh, policies and practices. Gain understanding of the client's business. Classify each process based on risk. Identify the client's high-risk processes. Again, that's the heat mapping, the brainstorming. 
identify the abnormalities that might occur in each high-risk process, determine how each identified abnormality would likely appear, gather necessary data and query it, and then review the identified abnormalities and refine. Uh, the best way to, to sort of sum this up is it's like taking a shower. It's wash, rinse, repeat. You, have to do, you can't do this once. You have to do it multiple times because every time you flesh out a possible abnormality, you have to then review that abnormality, check to see if it's a true abnormality, if it's truly fraud, if it's truly a mistake, or what, identify what that risk really is to the organization. Um, the more refined your query is, the more specific your results will be, and the more accurate your results will be. But it's without going through all the steps the first time and doing them even a second time, it's going to be very hard to identify those actual abnormalities that are fraud versus what is just a mistake. And, and a, a good example of this is uh, one kind of common analysis that a lot of companies perform is comparing employee addresses to vendor addresses. And maybe the first time you do it, you don't realize that um, certain employees are paid as a vendor when they're reimbursed because of the organization's record keeping and the way they do their accounting. And so if you didn't ask the right questions at the front end, which hopefully you're asking the question before you run through the data, but if you didn't ask that question, the results are going to come out and they're going to show that there are a lot of employees that have a match. But you refine that and, and you redo the analysis, hopefully you're not ending up in a situation like that because it's not going to look good when your results come out and you've got 60 employee addresses that are all the same and they have 60 employees and it's like, well, hang on a second, everybody is a, is a vendor now and there's a reason for it. Um, so that's why you, you refine this process. Next. So fraud detection techniques, database mining, whistleblowers, hotlines, financial statement analysis, uh, control testing overrides. Um, i going to go talk a little bit about my background, um, and hopefully after this story and slide, hopefully lunch will be here shortly. Um, so before I came to HW about two and a half years ago, I worked for a couple of years in South Florida. And I know I heard several people mention Ponzi schemes and Ponzi schemes. I worked for an accounting accounting firm that did the accounting for a bankruptcy receiver on a Ponzi scheme. It was a attorney in Fort Lauderdale and over about four year period stole 1.4 billion dollars. Um, billion. Uh, true numbers are a little different there but the, the matter is still ongoing. And it was one of those things that the FBI came in, seized everything, uh, I worked the bankruptcy side, but the way the whole thing was found out was through a whistleblower. So th this Ponzi scheme was built off of unregistered securities. And this attorney was very into, uh, he did a lot of employment law, did a lot of uh, whistleblower cases himself, um, harassment, that sort of stuff. And he created what, uh, has anyone seen the, the J.G. Wentworth commercials, structure settlements, I need cash now? Um, I won't sing it, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, so he created these structured settlement payments for clients that he said won these deals. So Sally May was harassed by her boss at some big corporation. It, it was all made up. So you pick a name and that's who it was. She won a million dollars and she was going to get paid that million dollars over five months. Sounds pretty good to me. But she really needed that money now. And she really only needed about $750,000 of it, but she needed it right now. Couldn't wait. So I'm going to turn to you, investor, and say, Sally May really needs $750,000 $750, right now. If you give me the $750,000, you can have her payment stream for a million dollars, and you'll get it back in five months. And so he had, it was a small group of investors at first, and they said, that sounds great. Where do I sign up? So started very small, started you know, $600,000 for 900,000 return over maybe a six or nine month period. Um, it eventually grew to where he was giving annualized returns of three, four, 500%, um, offering a million and a half for $500,000 or $750,000 over three months. Um, sounds pretty good to me. 
uh, I'd like to sign up, except I know that's not realistic. Um, so what happened was around 2009, he went and all his investors who originally were just saying, this is great, I want to keep investing, keep rolling the money, keep rolling the money, let's go, let's make more money. Well, some of these investors now wanted their money. 2009 hit and they said, I need my cash, can you send it out to me? So it was time to find new investors. He hadn't had to do this for the first three years and you know, he had his little group, so he had to go out and find new investors. So lo and behold, he goes out through some uh, community connections, goes out and meets some other attorney and says, you know, please invest in this. This is great. Look at all these returns that people are getting. This is a wonderful idea. I they think the attorney took three seconds to look at it and said, and said this smells. Um, so he went and reported it to the uh, FBI. And the FBI ended up raiding the office. Um, the guy, his name's uh, Scott Rossi, in case anyone heard of it. It's been on those American Greed shows in a few different places. He fled, before the FBI raided the office, he knew what was going on. He fled to Morocco with, uh, drained every trust account the law firm had and fled to uh, Morocco for $16 million in a briefcase. It was really just wired to an account over there. And left, left the country. So now he comes back. 15 days later, no one knows why, there's an extradition. Uh, two weeks after that, he gets arrested, and turns out he wore a wire for the FBI, rolled over in some mobsters, had them launder $50,000 for him and try to box documents. Uh, he's now serving time in uh, witness protection for a very long time. But the whole thing was made up. People, uh, eight arrests and hundreds of millions of dollars have been recovered, but as a whistleblower, the SEC has whistleblower protection laws now. So as a whistleblower, not only do you get protection, but now whistleblowers are entitled to monetary recoveries on anything that the government recovers. So depending on what the government recovers, uh, the monetary recovery for a whistleblower can be anywhere between 10 and 30% of the recovery. So if you see anything going on, uh, report it, you may. Uh, find yourself in some very good financial position and have done some good for other people as well. Um, why fraud detection is important? Uh, losses grow geometrically over time. People start with $10, $50, $100. They sort of test the water, see what they can get. And as it keeps going, the, the gall of, of the employee committing the fraud keeps growing and they, they just, you know, it consumes them to the point where they are not taking PTO. They are working their, their butts off to make sure that this fraud stays intact and sometimes not even enjoying the money that they have. Um, the longer the fraud continues, the lower the likelihood of recovering the, the assets. As I said, in the job I worked on in Miami and Rothstein for a couple of years, there was no cash. There was no money. Um, everything that he got, he had 13 houses and 10 cars, a couple boats, um, lots of jewelry and bad watches and bottles of wine and things of that nature, um, which in 2009 real estate wasn't worth much and the value of cars that are $300,000 cars or I think he had two Bugattis even, those had some resale, um, but the value is not what the cash is. And so it was very hard to recover anything from the estate. Uh, they are, they get slammed. They, there, there's more people who send them complaints than they know what to do with. And at the moment, they, their answer is, they're, you know, people are out of luck. There, there's only so much they can do. Um, you know, until government budgetary restrictions lift, um, it may go on, things may go undetected. I, I think Madoff was reported to the SEC several times yeah, um, before anyone actually took it serious. You know, Madoff was head of the NASDAQ, very respected in the community. Um, you know, what he did was very much, he, he wasn't, I'm going to give you 400% return. It was, I'm going to give you 14, 15% return a year. High times, it was maybe a little more than that, but he was consistency over a long period of time, and he was very select with the people he had invested with them. Um, we've done some work and still do some work on sort of the fringes of Madoff, um, and there were some, you know, there's a lot of collateral damage with, with him. There was, there was people who had money invested in funds, who then those funds were unknowingly to the original investor was invested in Madoff funds, which lost a lot of money. Um, and so those people are slowly starting to file claims to collect. Um, I think 
I know most of, a lot of the Madoff claims um, actually they expect a lot of uh, almost a full recovery on a lot of those claims for some of the actual Madoff investors, and so I know some people have sort of factored and sold their claims for you know they'll, they'll sell their claim for seventy or eighty cents in the dollar, and the person who bought it is hoping to collect ninety to hundred cents in the dollar, um, and that's a, that's a rare situation, um, but because you've got people paying back investors who made money paying back billions of dollars into these funds to pay back the investors who actually lost money. But yeah, the SEC, the complaints that they get are astronomical. Um, it's like any government, police, federal organization, they get a million people calling them with complaints every day saying, you know, my neighbor's looking into my window or, you know, this guy's, uh, I think he's stealing checks out of my mailbox. You know, people come up with, with complaints all the time. It's the SEC has a very strict budget on a lot of stuff they can spend and do, but it's uh, a lot of stuff probably goes undetected. I, mean, I think uh, another area a lot of people should consider, um, and kind of maybe different, coming from being in this environment, having to deal with Dodd Frank, which is the act that um, created all of these uh, whistleblower things, um, is that organizations are developing departments, these are larger public organizations, or developing, larger organizations, you can't hear back there. Do that. That work? So, larger, no, it's kind of in and out. So, in response to some of this, larger organizations are actually creating departments that um, are there to handle hotline phone calls. And so a lot of these public companies are uh, building out these types of programs so that whistleblowers aren't immediately walking to the SEC, that they're giving the organization the opportunity to investigate allegations. Um, and so that's also an avenue that people can can take as well is to, if they want to be anonymous, report these through the appropriate channels within the organization. And organizations are definitely taking these allegations seriously. I know all of the, the individuals I know that, that work in these types of depart departments um, take each allegation very seriously and make sure that they get back to the individual that had the allegation indicating we've, we've taken this seriously, we've investigated it, and, and in some way um, let them know some, some level of the results associated with it. So there are other avenues but beyond just going direct to the SEC. So I think, uh, I guess we can just move into the next section if we uh, don't have check lunch out. yet. I'm not sure where lunch went. It's going to be here sometime between 12 and 12 30. So let's, yeah. Maybe we can call Doug. Yeah, let's pause for uh, a couple minutes and, and try to figure out where lunch is, and we'll, we'll continue. This is a little PSA announcement. If anyone's got the key tags to get into the room, I, I think they're floating around somewhere. Uh, there's two of them. At some point, we need them back. Otherwise, we're in trouble. <laughs> there, there's a lack. Lack controls. Um, I, I segregated the duties to whoever sat at those tables, and it's failed. So, um, all right. So we're going to sort of switch gears slightly and and uh, talk a little bit about um, some of the technology that we use um, in doing some of these fraud risk management procedures and audit assist procedures. Um, so, audit procedures, brainstorming sessions, interviews management, and forensic, forensic data analytics. Um, you know, I'll talk a little bit about the use of Excel versus ACL versus IDEA and some of the other tools that we use. Uh, Benfer analysis, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, user activity analysis. Um, you know, there's all the computers and all the systems have logs and track user activity. Everything from 
when a uh, thumb drive or external hard drive has been entered into a USB port. Um, a lot of that's used when we use uh, experts on the data analytics. They use those kind of tools to identify if they believe information was taken uh, from the company and maybe on a certain day by a certain employee. They can see if that employee's machine had a thumb drive accessed into it at 3.28 a.m. And at 3.30 a.m., all the files were copied. You know, something of that nature. They can, they can look into that, all that information. Uh, day of the week analysis. Um, clearly, things on weekends and holidays on company dollar are more suspect than others. Um, comparing databases and predictive coding, which is sort of the next wave of the future, which I'll go over at the end very briefly. So ACL versus Excel. So everyone knows how to use Excel. Uh, ACL is, does a lot of stuff similar to IDEA. We, I think, like it a little better because the language is a little simpler, uh, a little more user-friendly. Um, but they essentially the same concept. Um, I know I, the firm uses IDEA, and we do like IDEA for importing PDFs because the PDF reader and writer into database is much easier than ACL. So import unlimited number of records in various file formats, and I'll show an example of how large some of the record sets can be. Uh, keeps unopened tabs in the background, saves on RAM. I'm sure everyone's attempted to open up large Excel spreadsheets and gone and got a cup of coffee, walked around the office five times, come back and it's still not open. Um, ACL sort of avoids that. Filters data easily. Again, it, it, because it works so much in the background, all the data is not live and active, does not take up active RAM memory, makes filtering easier. Uh, summarize classifies, classified data. Again, that's sort of the pivot tabling in these tools. Searching within the data set, uh, finding duplicate transactions, uh, gaps in sequence. These are all you know, techniques in, in that auditors use, but we use as well to identify fraud. Find sequences, find blanks, uh, Benford's aging of AR statistics. Um, so unlimited number of sorts and comparing and combining uh, data elements using unique identifiers relating tables is a big thing. So Benford's Law. Who's heard of Benford's Law? Anybody? Would anyone like to, to give an explanation of Benford's Law? Would anyone like to try to explain it? Um, Benford's Law is based on the number of times a particular digit occurs in a particular num position number. So Benford's Law was originally found out by um, the person who created Benford was flipping through a logarithm book and noticed that the pages were more worn towards the beginning than they were towards the end. And pages of certain numbers were more worn in different, the corner was more worn in different areas. And so he figured out that when you combine a, when you look at natural numbers, natural numbers are defined as not made up numbers, but natural numbers as Usually, it, it tends to like to be numbers that are combining or a product of two other numbers. So let's say payroll is a good example. So it's an hourly rate times by number of hours is a combination of numbers come up with, a pay, with an actual paycheck amount. That's considered a natural number. Um, that numbers appear in a certain part of the, of the sequence at certain frequencies. So you're more likely to have ones in the, first call, in the first digit, then you are twos, threes, fours, fives, and sixes, and so on. When you get to the second digit, again, the likelihood of having a one, two, or three is more likely than having a six, seven, eight, or nine, but the spread between the two are, becomes smaller. And I'll show you in a table what I mean in a second. Um, and as you go further down the number, the percentage of, of, of chance of occurrence, the probability of occurrence, becomes smaller until it's basically even. Um, in case anyone's really a math genius, that is the formula to perform Benford's. I do this by hand when I actually do the analysis. Um, so here's the table I'm talking about. So when you look at a number, let's say let's take the number, uh, let's take the number 100. So it's much easier to get to 100. It takes much less to go from 100 to 200. Let's say, so from the first digit to the second digit, the spread's much smaller on the first column of first digit from 1 to 2 than it would be to get from 100 to, let's say, 900. The, 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 the gap is greater. The jump is greater. But as you go further down, if you're going from 159, or from 157 to 159, you only have to jump two digits, two units, versus as if it was 
170 versus 190, you'd have to jump 20 units. So that's why as the, as the digit goes further down in the number, it becomes more and more, the, the spread becomes much smaller. It's a little difficult, hard to explain and understand, but I will show it in use uh, shortly. So some red flags and things that when doing analysis that to look for, um, comparing vendor files to employee files, we talked about this at length before. Just because there's a match doesn't mean that there's not a reason for a match, but it's very useful in doing those techniques. Duplicate invoice numbers, uh, missing address information, invoice overpayment, uh, round dollar amounts, uh, Benfords, and then doing searching and filtering. So I'm going to sort of switch gears here a little bit and show you ACL and the tool and how we use it and what it looks like. So this is the home screen to ACL. Um, it's not too different from idea. The, the pictures and the numbering are a little different. I think this is ACL 9. They've now come out with 10 and 11. I think they've gotten to more ribboning in their in their menu bars, and so it looks a little different than this, this now. But you've got your folders on the left, your recent projects in the middle. Um, everything is in a folder system, all your databases. So I go into the training. So as you can see, you have your main folder up here and all your tables below it. The table with the little green dot on it shows what's open. Um, so as you see, I've got a vendor file. So I've got vendor names, street addresses, zip codes, bank accounts, invoice numbers, invoice amounts, uh, lots of information. Um, I've got some employee information. So again, employee names, uh, street address, <laughs> zip codes, bank accounts. And so I want to show one of the things that we do a lot when we do data analysis is create unique identifiers. Unique identifiers is the greatest and easiest way to relate tables. Um, it's if you were just to use, let's say, I want to do a unique identifier based off of zip code or street address. It's very hard. You know, you'll get you'll get matches on some, but you won't get matches on others, and you really can't relate your table. So if you were to look at this vendor file, and I'm gonna. So if you're going to look at this vendor file, what type of information would you think you'd want to use to make a unique identifier? Sorry? The invoice number? Maybe the invoice number. But if you're looking more for vendor versus, let's say, vendor to employee, not just necessarily invoice number. The employee is not going to have an invoice number. So if you're going to replay it, relate an AP file to an employee file, what would you maybe want to use as, an invo as a unique identifier? Street maybe the street address, but what if something is listed as, uh, as up there, fake street? Maybe they use a period, maybe they don't use a period, maybe they spell out the full name. You know, if there's, like I said, bad data is bad results. So maybe that's, you know, words are very difficult sometimes. People abbreviate things differently, miss typos. Zip code, Zip code is a good one. Um, and sort of say, to, to go sort of combining the two, what you can do is you can take zip code, but zip code is not unique for everybody. However, if you do in Excel terms, essentially a concatenate of maybe the numbers of a street address to the numbers of a zip code, you can create one long number and create a unique identifier for each person based on their individual street code number and zip code number. And hopefully, there's no typos, or there's less likely to be typos in those numbers to create the unique identifier. So to do that in ACL, so that's what a formula in ACL looks like to create that unique identifier. So the all trim is a term that's used in ACL to, to remove all leading spaces and zeros. Um, in ACL language, if there's a space within the column, it's considered to be filling up a digit. It, it's, it, it's recognized as something. So you want to remove all spaces and leading zeros. 
The next set is the substring. That takes numbers and turns numbers into text so that you can relate the two texts so it's not read as a number. So then I take street address. And since I know all the numbers are only three digits, I had looked at that before, I only take the first three digits of the street address. I do the same thing for the zip code. I know zip code should be five numbers. I only take five numbers. That's all I want it to do. I want it to trim everything else around the five numbers. If the street address was longer than three numbers, but I know the shortest is three, then I would still want to do an all trim of three, and I'd chop off the back end number, but this way I don't have any leading zeros or spaces in my, my unique identifier. So to add something into ACL, all I do is right click and you add a column, tell it what you want, and there, and there it is. Now the great thing about ACL is you cannot mess up data. ACL is fully static. It is not live. That's why it also does, it works a lot faster than Excel. So if you were to add or remove something, it doesn't change the actual data. It only changes what you see on the screen. So you can't accidentally type over something, delete something, remove something. It's all still there. You have not changed the root of the, of the information. So that's the unique identifier on the AP vendor file. And if you look at the employee file, you have that same unique identifier. And so now, now we want to relate the two tables. So I will show. So now I have the employee data file as the parent file. I want to add a table and relate it. So we add a table, vendor file. And I know, based on the type, that the, so N is for a number, D is for a date, uh, C is for a character field. So I know that you can only relate the same type fields. So I know that both my unique identifier and on both sides are the, are the character fields, and that's what I did with that uh, substring. So all you do is you drag across, and now they're related. So now I want to know, are there any, in, no, I'm in the employee file, I want to know if there are any employees that have the same unique identifier as a vendor. So all I do is you add column, and now in the add column you have the option to pick from any of your related files. So I take the AP file, and do their unique identifier. All these come up with zero. Well, there's one. This individual right here matches both files. So now I want to know maybe what invoice this individual has, what amounts they, they, they've been paid. So you can, same thing, you can add columns, go into the vendor file, you can do uh, the paid amount, maybe the vendor name. So there you go. So they were paid $550. And everything else, because of the unique identifier, everything that's not related will become, will be blank. And you can filter on, so you can filter on an individual cell. So I can say the zero and say, do a quick filter not equal to zero. And those are all my employees who now have vendor payments to them. And I can add whatever columns I want. I can move them. Um, you know, there's no cutting and pasting to move. It's just a, a drag. Um, it's very simple. Um, so that's how you can sort of relate two tables. To show you how complicated a relation can get, back out of this. Second. This is a case we worked on a while ago. So here's a table we made, we combined, it was a wage and hour case that we did. We had to combine punch data, we had to combine time sheets, we had to combine, what else do we have to combine? Is that it? Punch data and time sheets. However, they changed systems and some people were paid by day, some people were paid weekly, some people were paid bi-weekly, so everyone had different types of payments. So we had to create different ways in which they were paid. Sorry. 
So, so just as an example of how crazy relationship can get, uh, let me arrange tables. Oh, that that is arranged. Um, so these are all the tables that are connected. So the one on the top left is the parent table. As you can see, then it has a few child tables, as I call them, down at the bottom. And then from those child tables, and grandchildren, stepchildren, whatever you want to call it, from those, and from the parent table, you can pull anything that's related through the child table, to, through the grandchildren table, you can pull anything back to the original table. You can make a, a whole separate table with all this information. Um, it's really a great tool for relating lots of data in lots of different places to get all the data into one screen where you can review it. So going back, going back to uh, large data. So I imported a file. It took a few minutes to import it, but it also takes a really long time to open it as well in, in Excel. So if you look down at the bottom, it tells you how, how big your data set is. So that says 1,048,575 records. And by records, it actually just means lines going down. So if you go out times that by nine, that's about 10 million individual data points. And they all have the letter X in them, except for one. One says Y. So if you were to try to filter this in Excel, try to find the Y, search for it, it probably could take a very long time. Then ACL, that's it. Found my Y. It was on row 432,816 in column 7. There is my one Y. And to unfilter it, just as easy, unfiltered. So when you're working with really large data sets like we've, have, like we've had to do in the past, it's extremely faster than having to work in Excel. Um, I know I've had Excel crash my machine here a few times um, when I have to do certain things. The downside to ACL is the formula language is a little more difficult um, and you can't, because it's not live, We've had cases where we've had to make live actual spreadsheets where we change a variable. So we work within ACL, export it out to Excel, and have to do ver changes in variables within Excel. And it's a lot more cumbersome than having to do everything in ACL, but it's um, easier to do that variable testing. So got about five or so, five, eight minutes. Uh, Benford's. So I talk about Benford's. Uh, so, Minnesota. Everyone's heard of Minnesota. Minnesota's got lots of lakes. I think the land of 10,000 lakes. Um, I think Wikipedia's a little lacking. They have 1,190 in their list. So I stole this out of Wikipedia. It's the list of lakes in Minnesota by square miles, I believe. Um, so there's 1,200 lakes and there's, bless you, and there's, there's square miles in size. And I want to run, this is, I would consider the size of lakes a naturally occurring, uh, a naturally occurring number. So I want to run a Benford's on it. So I'm running on size. I want it in a graph. I'm going to do it to two digits. One is good. I'll show you one. One's good, but it doesn't show you a whole heck of a lot to do a one digit. You know, things look like they may be in question, but can't really tell. I'm going to run it to two. Looks a little more better. Looks a little better. A little more better. Um, yeah, there's maybe a few items there, somewhere between 22 and 27 that maybe you'd question, but for the most part, it follows the trend line. But I went through, and I. Ch changed 20 numbers. So out of 1,190, I changed 20 of them. So a little over, what is that, a little over 2%, or a little over 1%. And I want to see what that would do 
on the analysis if we ran Benford's on it. So again, we'll look at one, one number. Again, doesn't look like there's anything suspicious. Again, maybe in the twos, something we, we may want to consider. If we look at it, two digits. Now there's something a little funky. Again, the twos we may want to look at, but now there's something going on between 49 and 53 that may be of interest to us. And if we want to make sure that what we're seeing is, is correct, you can do it to three digits. And now something really stands out. And now you're wondering what's going on there. Something doesn't look right. So with ACL, you have the ability to drill down. It's easier on two. So I see this line. I want to know what this line is. All I do is double click it. There it is. So all these lakes, let's pretend they are transactions or suspiciously, suspiciously round dollar 500. Now, as known before, just because it's an exception doesn't mean it's, it's, it's fraudulent. All of these seem like they could be potentially real, as well as some of the ones at the top. But there are some within that set that look like they don't match. And so you'd want to investigate those further. And what we can do is we can take columns. I created some columns where you can take the last. Where So I turned it into text, and I pulled the last two digits out of each column. And so when you unfilter on this, you can now do a search on 5. Double zero, oopsies. And last. And so now that's every transaction that is a round transaction, that some of which are fake, and maybe if you did this, you'd look at it and go 600, 700, 200, 300, those I didn't see before, but now maybe I want to look at them. And I actually didn't alter those. Those are naturally occurring, evenly square, mild lakes in Minnesota, apparently. Um, but it raises the question of, what do you want to look at? And now there's, if you want to do, you'll, as you see on the bottom, there's a question mark. Uh, I want to count the records. 37. So there's now 37 items of note that you'd maybe want to look at as a friends account and as an auditor that say, these are the ones that I question, these are the ones I want to look at. But you may want to notice, that, or you may take a look at it and again refine it and say, all of these that are these really large ones, maybe those are the ones I want to focus on if this was dollars or money, those are the ones to focus on. Or if there's, you can take 500 and say, there's a lot of 500s, I'm just going to Do a quick filter, see how many equal 500. And so maybe those are the ones you want to focus on. And so these are the kind of things that we do uh, a significant amount and that we have the ability to do and that technology allows us to do. And when you're talking on record sets that are hundreds of thousands of lines, millions of lines, tens of millions of actual individual cells of data, or things that are in five places, or maybe all the data, instead of being online, is in a PDF. And you want to be able to get a PDF of an Excel printout that someone handed you, put it onto a system, and spit it back into Excel and analyze it, or spit it into ACL and analyze it. 
And these are all the things that technology has enabled us to do and do our job more efficiently. And I think it's 1.45. I think we're right on time. All right. Uh, the only thing I got is predictive coding. So take two minutes. So predictive coding. Um, this is sort of the way of the future. Large uh, data sets, large amounts of information, e-discovery techniques. So uh, anyone who's audited or been around uh, document review knows that when you get a tens of thousands of emails, the first person, the staff person, or intern usually goes through and identifies, you know, important, very important, you know, stop, you know, high risk, low risk, and you just kind of flag it. And then someone else has to go through and review it again, and review it again. You have to do it every single one, and you can sit there for hours and hours on that. Predictive coding, they've created a technology that allows you to take a sample set of documents and an e-discovery matter. And let's say you run through 100 or 500 of these documents it then learns the key indicators within the documents that are sort of the patterns repetition that you're looking for and then can apply it, and it creates an algorithm and applies it through the rest of the documents. So it can cut time significantly in half, or more than half. Now, maybe you say that's not good because now I can't bill it. Um, that I've had a computer do it for me. But there's still the review process. It's still not 100% accurate. You still have to check for exceptions. But it creates tremendous efficiency that not only helps us do our job better, but makes clients happier, um, that you can sort through large, large e-discovery data sets much quicker, find the specific documents of high importance much faster, and get to a result that is amenable to everybody and works for the client. <laughs> so. So the next uh, portion is going to be applying everything you've learned